Um, I'm Gina Myers. I'm the horticulture agent in Wake County, and it's really my pleasure to be able to introduce Louise, uh, not only because she is an amazing master gardener, but she's a dear friend. So it's uh, wonderful to be able to do this. Some of you are master gardeners, but I imagine I'll have a thing or two to tell you about Louise <coughs> real quick that you didn't know. Um, she grew up in the suburbs of Boston, Massachusetts, and um, I went to school up there, so she keeps forgetting and thinks that that's where I was born, but I wasn't. Um, she moved to North Carolina in 76. She did her graduate work in entomology at NC State University. And she is the least bragger about it, but she has her PhD in entomology, <coughs> so you're gonna love um, what she shares with you today. And she ended up marrying her statistics professor. <laughs> but after class has finished. After class has finished. It did not help her, she's super smart. Um, native, she is a native plants advocate. She has a gorgeous yard that's shaded and uh, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And wanted me to remind you that there is a native plants conference in Cullowhee coming up that is just superb. So, uh, there's still time to register for that. She's been a master gardener for 10 years or so. We were negotiating this uh, in the bathroom there. Um, and she's won statewide master gardener of the year. In our program, she helps lead the, well, she does lead the training program for new master gardeners. So, <laughs> so if any of you have thought about doing that, um, she takes a great pride in, in developing an excellent program for new master gardeners. Um, so I believe that's all I will share about Louise, but um, anything else? No, I think that's it. Is the mic working? Yes. yes. Oh, good. Okay. So, Enjoy. So I have to tell you, first of all, this talk actually started off as what you don't see in the hidden life of insects, but somewhere along the line, the title was truncated. But this is not a talk about metaphysics. We can go into that <laughs> later. Turn up a little bit. Do I know how to turn it up? <laughs> there a button? I can turn it up on. On the computer. Okay. <clears throat> is that any better? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, you don't have black here. <laughs> <coughs> so, okay. yeah. so um, if this is going to be about bugs and other insects, and uh, first of all, we usually only notice them when we see them. I mean, unless you're the kind of person who lies awake at night worrying about termites eating your subflooring, we don't notice them, we don't think about them until we either see them in the air, on our plane, or they're bugging us. But the fact is <clears throat> that most of what we're seeing are adults in their winged reproductive stage. And, and for many, it's at 90 to 99% of their lives is, is lived hidden from us. So what are they doing when we don't see them? <clears throat> um, uh, many insects have only one generation a year. And uh, most of that is hidden from us. Are uh, usually in the ground. It just works. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, there are a number of insects that do live above ground their entire lives. Um, most caterpillars, as we know, feed on leaves, and then we see the butterflies feeding on nectar <coughs> or the moths. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and while most beetles um, live their juvenile lives underground, there are a number of beetles that also live all their lives above ground. And here we have, of course, a lady beetle larva, which is predaceous. It's predaceous as a larva. It's predaceous as an adult. Another beetle that we know from plants is the Colorado potato beetle. It is a plant eater as a larva. It is a plant eater as an adult. It's not always true of insects that metamorphose that they feed in the same way as uh, larvae and as adults, for instance, flies often have uh, chewing or sucking mouth parts as larvae, and then they, as adults, flies are really diverse. They can have spongy mouth parts, they can have chewing mouth parts, and they can have piercing mouth parts, as we well know. <coughs> uh, 
Um, anyway, these larger aphids here are actually adults, although they do not have wings. And these have been produced parthenogenically. That is that they are all clones of themselves. And these adults are doing live birth of their, their offspring. Uh, and and uh, this is the major way that aphids will reproduce during the year. So while some insects live above ground during their lives, as I've mentioned, most insects are hidden underground during their juvenile stages and emerge from the ground only as adults. Um, and a number of species live their entire <coughs> lives underground, uh, where uh, for some of them, the adult, they don't even have adults, the adults don't even have <coughs> wings. So many beetle larvae, which are often called grubs, are mobile and underground, and some of them feed on roots, some of them are predaceous, some of them feed on rotting material. Um, and they come up to the surface as adults in order to mate. And this, both of these guys, are salads, best beetles. Best beetles are really neat because they make a lot of different sounds. They, I, they actually have I, 14 different vocalizations. So they're pretty communicative. They are also what are called subsocial because the adults will pre-digest food with the assistance of bacteria and fungi and then feed the larvae. Uh, themselves. So the larvae do not feed themselves. They rely on the adults for their food. So they have been dubbed as subsocial. <clears throat> um, and you really, you almost never see them above ground. But if you're out in the woods and you're turning over logs, you can find entire populations. You can find the larvae and the pupae and the adults. And the adults will go squeak, 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 <laughs> which you've probably heard. <coughs> uh, now this is a crane fly, and <coughs> it has spent probably about 345 days of the last year of its life in uh, invisible from us in a moist environment where it was feeding <coughs> on uh, plant decaying plant material, and it only emerged as an adult and. <coughs> where, again, its primary business is reproduction. <coughs> uh, and this, like many insects, only lives a few days as an adult. Uh, some uh, insects as adults actually have vestigial mouthparts. That is, that the, the mouthparts are so atrophied they cannot feed. And that's the case in many of the crane flies. And although they're called mosquito eaters, they do not eat mosquitoes. They, if any crane fly can feed it all, it can feed on plant nectar. They don't bite. <coughs> uh, and they are, of course, as I mentioned, flies. And flies are in the order called diptera, diptera wings. So you can see that, in fact, it has only two wings. It has these two little tiny things here called haltiers, which are modified second set of wings. And it's believed that they use them for balance when they're flying. But anyway, that's a little aside on that. Um, so <clears throat> we only see a very small part of ants' lives, although we notice them when they're out foraging for food. They live most of their lives underground. And this, this whole thing, is an Allegheny mound ant mound. And this one, I took this picture a couple of weeks ago in, in New Hampshire, and I was amazed at this. I mean, this was, you can see, this this is 10 feet long. And this is in a chilly environment. So they go deep underground during the cold winter, and then as it gets warmer, they get more active. And basically, the mound is the excavation of their space. So you can judge how big their colony is underground by how much stuff they had to move out to, to uh, accommodate themselves. <clears throat> so 
So here, this is from the same mouth, here are, the, here are two little foragers out here doing their job collecting. <coughs> Um, yeah. the, the, what, the, what happens inside the colony is really most of the life of the ants, though. And, and this actually, you can see, see this sort of tunnel space? This is a brood chamber. I have a, a, an old pot sitting out, and it, it just, my, I lost my plant, and it was just sitting there. And I finally thought to myself, I should dump it. And I dumped it out, and lo and behold, there was a colony of ants inside. Um, and as you can see, these, these girls are really scurrying because the larvae will desiccate quite quickly if they're not kept in a humid environment. So here we see tiny larvae and bigger larvae, and here's a bigger one. And then we also see pupae, and uh, the pupae tend, see this one even it looks kind of collapsed. The pupae <clears throat> tend to be a little bit yellowish in color. They actually have a, a, uh, a pupil skin around them. So these, these girls are all very busy trying to relocate. And in fact, a half hour later, there wasn't an ant left in that pile of stuff. They had all gone into the ground underneath to sort of get themselves together. When I broke it open, I have to say, for a moment, I saw the queen. I was like, oh! And so I <laughs> ran back to the house, get my phone, take a picture. And of course, there was no queen around by the time I got back. I would have loved to have taken a picture of her. She, of course, is about four times the size of the workers. And, and the size of ants really varies according to the kind of ant it is. I mean, the variation between the sizes there. There can be soldier cast, there can be workers, there's a queen. Um, so it's sort of, <clears throat> uh, it there is dependent on the ant species. So um, some ants live their entire lives under the ground, um, and only the winged reproductive ones ever come up. Uh, and the, what we see is, um, for instance, citronella ants, which are a local ant of ours, feed uh, in a kind of a complex relationship <coughs> off the honeydew <coughs> produced by um, mealybugs or aphids feeding on the sap of the roots of shrubs and trees. So they're entirely underground. The aphids are, are producing sap. The, uh, the ants are eating the sap. Then only when it's time to produce a winged generation, which is March more or less, the, they're a bunch of uh, workers, unwinged workers, will help these sexually reproductive male and females. Uh, they don't produce males except when it's time for reproduction. Up out of their nest onto higher areas so that they can fly away. Um, I, I, it turns out they've been living on one of my camellias for years. And I thought, oh, I'm going to watch this and see if it'll, you know, if I need to get rid of this guy. Camellia has been unharmed. I mean, it is a huge plant. It doesn't seem to be bothered at all by the end. So I'm very happy to support this little, <laughs> this whole little menagerie uh, underground there. And but I found them climbing up on my um, a, my foundation wall, and, and how I knew they were citronella ants is because I crushed them. And if you and if they're scared or if you crush them, you can smell the citronella. <coughs> So, uh, so sometimes we only see the feeding damage done by insects, and um, you may have recently noticed lines of ants carrying little leaf discs. Did any of you see this this spring? It's really pretty neat. I mean, it's like little soldier ants. They're all walking along. <laughs> anyway, it, this is um, a red bud. Uh, seedling uh, in my garden, and if you look, these are not caterpillar or be beetle feeding. This, these are cutouts done by the ants, and and this uh, this ant also has a really interesting uh, mechanism of uh, living symbiotically. They carry the leaf discs down underground to their chamber, where they inoculate them with a fungus. They eat the fungus. 
and then they <laughs> feed that fungus to their larvae. So they're busy feeding the fungus, which will feed themselves. <coughs> so you may never see them. Uh, or the only part of them you'll ever see are these little you know, parade of ants holding these little leaves over their heads. So um, some insects go through complete metamorphosis. Flies, beetles, moths, everybody in the hymenoptera, that includes the wasps, bees, the, oh, I already mentioned wasps. No, flies, wasps, bees, bees ants. <coughs> um, and some insects go through what's called simple metamorphosis. That is that, like stink bugs, they start off really tiny, and then as they go through the various instars, they get, their wings get a little bigger, a little bigger, a little bigger, a little bigger, and then finally they get to the adult stage when they have wings. The insects that go through metamorphosis go through an entire, there's a period when they're entirely quiescent, and they are just hanging out, changing radically from the larval form into the adult form. <coughs> And another thing that happens for a lot of insects that live an entire year is that they go through a period of diapause. <coughs> and um, what are we, what, second term? Um, so moths and butterflies generally enter diapause as pupae. Um, some other species go into diapause as an egg or as a last instar larva. And uh, some even as adults, um, particularly in the cases of beetles and some of the hemipherans. Um, the, those, the brown marmorated stink bugs that we've all come to know and not love, <coughs> in fact, uh, go into diapause in winter. Um, and they are adults when they go into diapause. Uh, the catch with them, the part of the reason we find them pesky is that they cannot easily survive our winter climate. Our native stink bugs often find a little place under bark or something like that in order to overwinter. The, the brown marmorated stink bug has to find a warmer spot. So it, it's attracted to warm spaces. It climbs into your house and it hangs out in diapause. That's not feeding, it's not doing anything. It's just hanging there until it's time to re become active again when environmental conditions are right. And then it goes out and it starts laying eggs and going on from there. <clears throat> what we see in the Japanese beetle is, okay, here she is, she's laid eggs. It's feeding on grass roots, feeding on grass roots, feeding on grass roots. This is from June to September. Then it goes farther under the soil where it's protected from the cold. And it hangs out in November, December, January, and February doing nothing. It is in diapause. It's like real slow-mo. <laughs> and, and then, as the conditions get warmer in the spring, it starts to warm up. That last instar larva moves up in the soil, pupates, and then, in about a month, comes out. And you can see that the life of the adult, although we see Japanese beetles, which, God, they're around forever, actually lives <coughs> only a matter of a couple of weeks. An individual is going to come out as an adult, mate, lay eggs, and die within a few weeks. <laughs> but they live an entire year. <clears throat> um, okay. So virtually all insects have an egg stage. <clears throat> and we may not notice it. Oftentimes it's underneath leaves. And, and just like the rest of insect development, it is temperature dependent. So the egg stage may last only a couple of days. So you really have to sort of look for them in order to find eggs of, of insects. <laughs> now, I, I said virtually all insects have an egg stage. Interestingly, most aphid species, almost all aphid species, have an egg stage. They, they're, they produce winged sexual adults in the spring that may produce eggs. And then from them, we have this entire genera generation after generation after generation during the summer of, of these clonal 
uh, populations. And it's not until fall that <clears throat> they will again um, be able to produce a wing stage. And most of our aphids, in fact, don't live here. They, they are blown in from warmer climates. So the winged aphids start <clears throat> someplace else. <coughs> So, except for the time in diapause, most insects live most of their lives as immatures. <clears throat> um, and that, that applies even to the species that have more, more than one generation a year. <clears throat> um, and lots of insects, including those in the wasp family, remember that's also bees and ants, um, are hidden during their juvenile stages. And, and interestingly, hymenoptera larvae cannot feed themselves. They cannot move. I mean, you saw the picture of the, the ant tending, you know, rescuing all those larvae. They can't move. They're completely dependent upon their mothers or their sisters, if, in the case of social insects, for food. And here we see some little worker bees. And this may be an empty cell. What will happen here is that a queen will lay a single egg into that cell. The, the egg will um, hatch and the larva will start to grow and you here you see different size larvae uh, and here's one that's quite good size as soon as they've been, they've been feeding these larvae as soon as they get big enough what the workers will do is they will cap the cell with a little bit of the comb material and the uh, that insect will pupate within that cell and then she'll chew a little hole up through the top of it and emerge when she's ready, uh, when she's finished <coughs> uh, pupating. So this, we no doubt you all have seen. This is called the two-line spittle bug. And you think, well, I get the two lines, but why the spittle bug? And that's because this is the nymph of this insect. And I call it a nymph. It is not a larva because bugs, and everybody in that group, including aphids and what have you, don't go through metamorphosis. If you don't go through metamorphosis, you don't get to call yourself a larva when you're young. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nymph. You can call them all immature. Anyway, so this is the young of this. And you normally only see the spittle blobs. I actually had to smear the spittle away from this little fellow to see it. And usually there's only one bug inside the spittle blob. And um, they actually produce it um, by exuding stuff out their anus. And then they've got this special stuff that comes out of the, between their seventh and eighth abdominal segments, you know that, uh, which helps to uh, keep it slimy. It's mucilaginous. And then they basically, they fart into it. I mean, they produce <laughs> air bubbles from their anuses to produce, to get all this, uh, uh, these, I know, I just hear somebody saying, oh, God, she said insects fart. <laughs> uh, to produce all these bubbles. So they survive under this in order to be protected. So what happens is that the adults um, will feed on hollies and a few other plants in the fall. They can actually be a pest on hollies. Then they lay eggs into particular <coughs> spaces, oftentimes the sheaths where uh, um, grasses are. And then when the, they develop on warm season grasses, particularly, although you can find them on a lot of stuff, um, <coughs> uh, they, will, they will go through, they will, uh, feed as larvae here, as nymphs here, and, and then go on to produce another generation of adults. Usually there's more than one generation in North Carolina per year because it takes about two months to go through the whole life cycle. But, you know, what happens is a lot of times we don't know that the insect that we're looking at is the larva or the nymph of another insect. We don't necessarily associate them. <clears throat> and so adult mosquitoes feed on mammals, including us, but the larvae live underwater <clears throat> and they feed on plant detritus, you know, rotten plant stuff. And interestingly, what they're doing here at the surface, you all may know this, but this is how they breathe. 
They have little siphon tubes that attach to the surface of the water, which is the reason why some of the insecticides work by, by breaking up the surface tension of the water so that so the insect cannot attach to the surface. Um, Bill tells a story of when, during the Second World War, his dad would go out with kerosene-soaked rags. This is not recommended today. And he would throw them into these uh, marshy areas around where they lived, because that was a way to cause an oil slick on top of the water and get rid of the mosquitoes. We have better <laughs> so, so, um, so they live in the summer when it's really warm. It can take only about a week to go through an entire generation cycle for, an, uh, for a mosquito. <coughs> now, of that week, only a day or two is as an adult. So we're seeing this tiny piece of its life, and, and that, when we see them out there and they're biting us, those are females and they're getting a blood meal, so they have the nutrition to develop their eggs in order to do their purpose in life, which is to reproduce. And, and then that's really pretty much what it's about. So, you know, whether we find insects pesky or beneficial, what we, what we do oftentimes is key in on only one part of the insect's life. So there's, there's this whole other part that is invisible to us. So anyway, I hope you've learned something new about the hidden lives of insects. <laughs> yes? So how does this relate to the insect sprays that we see so commonly? You know, if they're only living for a day. I know. I know. I would not, I, I am not an advocate of those sprays. Uh, I mean, those sprays are used Really, the only effective way to use it is, oh, I'm going to have a party tomorrow night. They're going to come and spray today. Because if they spray four days ago, we got a whole other population out there by the time you get to your party. <laughs> so um, what happens is adult mosquitoes hang out in among the shade of trees, in among the leaves during the during the heat of the day, because they need a little humidity. They can't tolerate the sun. So they hang out there, and then as night falls and it, the humidity increases and it's shady everywhere, then they come out and then they start feeding on everybody. Which is why, if you're in the midst of the really good woods, even in the middle of the day, you'll find the mosquitoes because they are free to move about. So what those sprayer guys do is they go and they spray up into the trees so they are getting rid of the adult population which is there at that moment. I don't believe there's any residual effect because it's, it's not really, because the mosquitoes don't really hang out on the leaves and they're not eating the leaves so there's, they're really just, it's knocked down. Do they, does that chemical harm other insects? I think it's a I think it's a broad uh, broad spectrum insecticide. So yeah, so yeah. So if you have bees that are hanging out, you're doing it in your bees. So you're doing it in everybody. Um, and so I really recommend things like uh, you know Bt, which is Bacillus thuringiensis, um, was originally found to work on Noctuid, uh, which is a, a moth uh, family. <coughs> It was originally discovered to work on that whole family, which includes <coughs> um, corn earworm and a, and a bunch of other uh, insects. Then they discovered um, Israeliensis, which is Bacillus thuringiensis Israeliensis. Okay, so and that one is specific to mosquitoes, and the way it works <coughs> and uh, is that it, it gets into the they digest it, and it gets into the gut, and basically it, it, it just tears them up <coughs> from the inside out. Uh, so uh, a mosquito dunk that you put into a wa into your place where water sits is really a, a very effective way to reduce your mosquito population because they, uh, 
the mosquitoes eat it and are killed, <coughs> and you're not, because it's specific to mosquitoes, and I think gnats and maybe black flies, um, uh, there are a couple of species in there that it works on, um, that, <coughs> uh, that basically you're reducing those populations only. So if you have it in your, in your pond, where you have dragonflies that are living, that's another one that does almost its entire life in the water, and then comes out and see those pretty little darning needles. Um, so it doesn't affect them, but it will it will kill the mosquitoes. Any questions? Are those mosquitoes? Oh, oh yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, those are mosquitoes. So yeah, a larvae. And they do have these little caudal fins, uh, gills here, but I don't believe that they are able to get air through the caudal gills, so they really <coughs> rely on these little <coughs> siphoning jobs on the surface of the water to, to um, uh, breathe. Yeah. The Japanese beetle larvae, um, you said they go deeper in the winter. How, just out of curiosity, how deep? And then also, do they feed only on grass roots, or do they feed on roots of anything else? Just was curious. I think it's pretty much grass, okay. um, and <clears throat> but I'm not sure. But I think it's only grasses, um, and it could be a wide range of grasses. Um, and they go deep enough that they are uh, out of the root zone and in a place where you don't get a lot of temperature change. So in if you were in Massachusetts, they may well go eight inches. Okay. In North Carolina, my guess is they probably don't go more than about four. Okay. Because we know it doesn't get cold that deep. So they're just going deep enough that they can protect themselves. So the milky spore or something that you can spread on yeah. the lawn, does that just get Japanese beetle larvae? It does. Or it does is. it get someone else? Other that's it, that's, that's something which is specific to Papillionids, the Japanese beetle. Okay. The problem with milky spore is that it has a time lapse. It's like the old story of the rabbits and the foxes. You know, you get a big population of rabbits and then you get a big population of foxes. By the time You've got a big population of foxes. You've reduced your population of rabbits, so the foxes have nothing to live on, and their population drops. Same thing with milky spore. It takes a while to develop. You know, you've got a good population of, of Japanese beetles, so you introduce milky spore. It takes a long time to get a good population that's really controlling your Japanese beetles. All the Japanese beetles are no longer there. There's nothing to feed on. Je the milky spore disease is lost. So you're in this constant cycle of, of, of uh, you know, playing catch up. And of course, the other problem with milk spore is that you can't necessarily get your neighbors to use it. <laughs> so many of your Japanese beetles that are feeding on your rosaceous plants, or other plants too, they're, they're pretty omnivorous, um, uh, can be coming some distance from other sources. But I was more worried about, because I can pick them off the hibiscus you know, and then just use a bucket of water with a couple drops of soap and I yeah. just, you know, and when it's cool, either in the morning or evening, and yeah. they just drop. But the Japanese beetles as adults eating my stuff doesn't really bother me. I can deal with that. It's just I've had an explosion of moles in the entire yard this year, just an absolute explosion. And I, I don't want to go out and spread you know, if I go to the hardware store, they tell me buy this bag of insecticide that's going to kill everything in the soil. Yeah. And yeah. I didn't really want to do that. Yeah. But I'm trying to figure out what can I do to get rid of the moles. And I thought, well, get rid of what they're eating. But yeah. I don't know if they're eating just, I don't know if they're well, eating. Well, <coughs> they, they eat grubs and they also eat earthworms. <coughs> but um, it, it is, it's, it's just like the milky spore. You know, you have the moles because you have the grubs. Um, so, the question is, do you want to tolerate the moles? Do you want to get rid of the I am getting rid of them yeah. each year, but I can't get rid of them. Yeah, yeah. But, but it, is, it is that cycle. And, it's, um, and the, the moles, actually, I don't know where you live, 
but the fox is will eat them all, and so will a lot of the um, the king of the birds of prey will too yeah, as they come up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Foxes, but but you're right. Yeah. I mean, they can really, and the, so you have two sources of damage. One is that the beetles are eating the roots of your of your grass, and so you've got these dead areas where you've got beetles feeding away on the grass, and then you've got the moles coming in, tearing up what is left yeah. in order to eat them. And it's, it's, I don't have any grass. <laughs> <laughs> My solution. I saw a couple other hands up. I was just going to ask, the grubs that I find in the flower beds that's not near the grass, mm -hmm. what are those? Are those Japanese beetles? Uh -huh. or, but they look, Probably. They they, I mean, the they, they could be, but there's May, May, May beetles, June beetles, okay. all look really similar. Um, there are other, um, there are predaceous beetles that also look similar okay. uh, that are in the ground. Ground beetles are so predaceous. It's a beetle and of some sort it's instead of the Japanese beetle. It, yeah, very likely. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hey, I um, was messing with my kale yesterday, and it's real late, but you know, they're stressed out anyway, in the season. I was just leaving them. And clouds of white little flies came off them, which I hadn't seen up until this week. Are those just white flies? Probably, probably. Feeding on kale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have actually a cute little video here. Mm -hmm. I think some of you have probably seen it. Let me see if I can, let me figure out how to do this. Uh, getting close. This is um, it's gonna work. How do I just get this? It works. It's wrong. Uh, let's try this. Windows Media Player might do it. DLC works right now. Okay. Wait till it's a test to find DLC. Okay. <coughs> So this, you know, we have these little fuzzballs on our plants yes. and they hop around. This is, is actually a plant hopper it's called a flatted. And here you can see, there's this, that is this hand, its front feet, and all of that, well, now again, it was a very short video. <laughs> I, I can play it again if, if you want. Uh, here, hold on. That was on a chameleon? Yeah, that's on a chameleon. It's actually sitting on my patio. But but basically, these guys, and you can see a little bit of fuzziness up in here. And there's a little on the side. Um, there's a little fuzziness there. So they're, they're crawling around. And then you go to get them, and of course, they go, boink, and they fly off. And that is um, uh, a, another plant hopper. And basically, they've produced all this wax in order to protect themselves. So, anyway, but that's not your white fly. If you got if you got a lot of little white guys coming out, they're probably white flies. And they lay eggs on there, and then hatch directly from the eggs. Yep. Yeah. And, and in warm weather, you can go through a season or next year. I don't know. No, no, they'll go through a lot of generations. They will, and they and they are the bane. Uh, uh, greenhouse growers, uh, commercial growers and greenhouses, because once you get a white fly population, what do you do? Well, the Dutch figured out that there was a little wasp that was a good parasite. And so they keep these wasps in their greenhouses when they grow their tomato plants uh, in order to control their white fly population. But the problem uh, in the great outdoors is you can buy the wasps and you put them out and they'll go, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like buying ladybugs. By the way, when, when people buy ladybugs in order to control their pests, most of what is on the market, if not all of it, is actually exotic Asian lady beetles, and they are not the natives, and they are really voracious, and they are actually reducing our population of our native ladybugs. Mm -hmm. Because they're so good at their job. Mm -hmm. 
but the same problem there. You put them out, and bingo, you know, uh, they're gonna they're gonna go look for their look for their prey. Yeah. Is there a better solution for indoor growing than the yellow sticky? Um, oh, the bark? tack trap things. I think that they are really successful, actually. I know that they are a disaster if you bump into them. <laughs> uh, I don't know if any of you have played with tech trap, but it's messy stuff. But, but, but they work really well because, and actually you can use them in, in your garden. If you can hang a little card that's yellow uh, above your plants, you know, if you can put out a or something, they will come to them, the adults will come to it because they're attracted to yellow. I have used Vaseline on the outdoor cards. Uh -huh. I use what is sort of a school bus yellow yeah. to paint. Yeah. But I didn't know whether there was anything better than that. I mean, I, you can't, I you can't keep them. wasps living in your house. I mean, no. I mean, just like everybody else, they have to have a food source. So, you know, unless you've got a lot of white wasps, you're not going to have enough of them to keep the population going. But I've not tried Vaseline. I've used Tac Trap, but Tac Trap is really oh, tack -tack is messy amazing. stuff. Yeah, I've used it for. The, the caterpillar. Oh yeah, <laughs> the um, uh, the looper that goes up the oak trees. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. The oak canker worm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's yeah. You really you know you put on a pair of disposable gloves and you throw them and you turn them inside out and you throw them away. <laughs> you can not do it all. So. You, the ants, the non the ants you were talking about. Yeah. How they had brought all of that up, and so that means it's not. So how deep do those ants go? Well, that's that's that was in New Hampshire, right? So my guess is that they're probably a good foot underground. Okay. And that was in an old sand pit, so I think that the um, that you know there's a lot of um, wash of of, um, of sand and, and other materials that are easy to move. Okay. But and they actually do live in the upper parts of the mound too when. Mm -hmm. uh, you know when the it, when it's not too hot and not too cold, they live in the upper parts of the mound as well. I did the same thing you did with the pot. I did that just yesterday. Moved a pot, and there were ant eggs and ants scurrying all around, and they were gone in like five or ten minutes. All the eggs were gone. Not eggs. Or whatever they are. Yeah, yeah. So they're probably larvae, yeah. they were probably larvae. Yeah, yeah. Larvae, yeah. Anyway, the white things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They, they were gone. I was amazed yeah. how quickly they were gone. Do they hurt anything? Do they are they, they eat my plants or do uh, they eat my plants do at all? not are not plant feeders. Okay. I mean the the most problematic ants are the ones that nurse aphids, which is really kind of a cute relationship. You may have seen they will actually carry aphids to a plant and they get them going to a good population and they come up and they tap them with their antennae. And the aphid will produce a drip of honeydew, and they'll collect the honeydew, and they'll take it to go through this whole fungal deal and, and eat the fungus. But ants are predacious. I mean, I, I consider ants uh, good guys. I don't want them in my house. Um, and and <coughs> I belong to this neighborhood thing where you know you get these emails from everybody about everything. <laughs> and one of the things recent in the spring was, what do I use to get rid of the ants? And they were talking about all these organic. There's this, there's this lavender thing, and there's a this thing and a that thing. And I wrote in and I said, kill them. <laughs> the first ones that show up are scouts, and they are looking for food sources. So you kill every scout you find, and if you get any trail of ants, you take some good household cleaner and you wipe across it because they're leaving a scent trail to find, to go back to the same place. So, so you, cleanliness is really your, I, I don't use any chemicals, I mean I just, I just kill them and, it, and wipe off the scent trails. Is it true that boric acid, if they get it on their bodies, they'll take it back to the nest? Boric acid, I think, works as an abrasive. 
Uh, I don't think they take boric acid back to their nest. There are some plant, some ant baits that they do take back to the nest, but I think boric acid, just like for cockroaches, works because <coughs> it's, it, it abrades their uh, integument and, and, you know, insect skeletons on the outside, and that's what holds all their guts in, and it also holds all their moisture in. So once you've abraded that, I mean, even like just taking off the, the leg of an insect will usually kill it because it, it can't stand that loss of moisture. Yeah. So the forex made me think about diatomaceous earth. Da same, same deal. deal. It so is, so it is, it's an abrasive. So I have been, I'm in part of a community garden and they suggested that we could, you know, brush the squash plants with diatomaceous earth. With, do you think, have you ever heard of that or is that? Um, uh, my keep the, kill, keep the bugs off of it? I mean, I've been duct taping the eggs off the backs of the leaves and squishing any bugs. These are probably I squash see. bugs. Yeah. Yeah. But I didn't know if the diatomaceous earth really. Hey, you're the gardener. It's, it's only gonna. It's only gonna kill the adults that are crawling around. And once it rains. Yeah. It well, it can kill. That, it can so. kill caterpillars too if they walk over it. If they claw. If they crawl over it. But they. They. It has. It relies on their crawling through it. How Did vigilant. You know? I can't believe you're duct taping that. And it doesn't rest the leaves. I'm about ready to be done with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you that I have, yes. I have had, I always had a vegetable garden. And I moved to North Carolina to go to graduate school. And I had this really nice sunny backyard. And I thought, oh, I'm going to do it. It lasted one year <laughs> because the insects and the bacteria and the fungi are, there's such enormous pressure here compared to in a more northern climate that I just thought, oh, it's easier to go to the farm than the market. <laughs> but, but I mean, you know, but I have friends who, you know, they're doing what you, they go out and they, it's a daily routine, picking their bugs. And you do it. I do. For squash bugs, going under and getting the eggs yeah. is really key. I've been pretty effective. Because they stand out when you yeah. see them. Farmer's market. Farmer's market. Yikes. <laughs> I think about the gypsy moths. People are going after the gypsy moths. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, those, yeah. People use people use those for a long time in in New England, but uh, and they would sometimes just paint right on the tree, which is problem because you can't ever get rid of it, and it makes these big ugly rings. So now they recommend that you in fact put a burlap piece or something else, duct tape or whatever, around the tree and then paint that. Yeah, and then uh, the burlap part of it hung down yeah. over the area that we had painted and made it difficult. They had to go through with that. Yeah, because that's, that's what you want to do is trap them. Yeah? I have, I have a question about aphids. I have, I have had this running love-hate relationship with them. Anyway, they're all over my crazy I can't trees. believe you have a love relationship yeah. <laughs> at all. Now, I, I, tried, I tried spraying early. Yeah. But then now I've got the sooty mold, and now it's everything you, you see that says to spray, first of all, there's too much places for it to overspray to. So I'm, what are you spraying with? with? The neem oil. That's what uh -huh. they, everybody told me to use on it. You can also use soap. I use the sectocidal soap. I know, and I can't, I can't get, I couldn't get rid of them. Is your tree really stressed somehow? Is it no, in enough these sun? are, no, no, and there's six of them. usually they don't get them bad unless they're stressed. So what kind of tree is it? They're crepe Oh, yeah. And then I, everything says don't spray anything once they bloom. Well, they're all in bloom. Yeah. And then I got the Japanese beetles on top of it, so I'm like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's some species or some varieties that are more prone to sooty mold. Than, than well, the sooty mold is actually before. secondary right. because yeah. what happens is the aphid poop right. yeah. doesn't get taken up by anybody else, right. like the ants, and so mold grows on it right there. And once you've got the sooty, sooty mold, I mean, you know, that's a that's a Q-tip job. Oh, I know. So, are they in full sun? Um, most of them are in full sun, and there's two that are not, and one has it and one doesn't. Well, and part of the reason one has it and one doesn't is it's just like bagworms. That is, yeah. that those adults uh, are not 
winged. So they can't, they can simply spread out. Well, what can I do for next year? So I don't end up with Vigilance. You can spray a dormant spray for one thing, make sure you don't have something else like scale. Yeah. And then make sure it's in full sun, well drained. Yeah. Well, so the, don't the dor dormant spray I would work for scale, but I don't, you're not going to have aphids over no. wintering. So you hit it with the dormant spray, and then as soon as you see the first sign of aphids, you spray. Try and catch them with the horticultural <laughs> oil or or yeah, insecticide. Uh, and I think that the biggest part is, is vigilance. And of course, aphids, like a lot of insects, you know, it's why we don't see the eggs. They're underneath the leaves. The aphids often are underneath your leaves. Yeah, so in order there. to I spray, I mean, you've got to be... I know, I'm you know, underneath it with a yeah. hat and gloves. And <clears throat> yeah, yeah. yeah, I wouldn't do any oil need, that way. I wouldn't do... No, well, well that's what they told me to water. try first when it first at the beginning of the season before anything bloomed or anything. Yeah, because it, just it, it, it oils are oils are hard on the plants yeah, no. because the leaves need to breathe. Yeah. So if you spray an oil, especially if you're spraying it on the underside of the leaf where most of the stomates are, it gets very problematic for the leaves. That's why even insecticidal soaps, a lot of plants are sensitive to them too, and so they'll say, you know, spray it on, kill your aphids, and then spray with water. An hour so or two next later. year, next when year. the leaves first come out, I should just go ahead and spray. Because well, they're probably no, they're don't. probably reproducing in yeah. there. Yeah. Well, because watch. I mean, I, I watching is is the. Well, I know. I kept watching, and then all of a sudden they were there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's yeah. But they started. They started from single wing <laughs> yeah. colonizers. So. Um, what you want to do is watch, I mean, I, I get them on my irises, and, and you want to see, if you can catch them when you still have a wing one out there, you know you have a chance, because yeah. that means that the colony has not developed very so much. So that's as soon as the leaves come out. So they don't overwinter? They don't okay. overwinter? Most of the aphids do not overwinter here. That's what I was afraid of. Yeah, and they I won't, uh, yeah, and if they, uh, if the few species that do overwinter, are usually on um, uh, in wooded areas, right? You know, along the edges of fields and in weedy stuff. So, but they're moving. The winged population is the ones that are moving into your uh, into your uh, horticultural crops. Okay. When the children in our neighborhood were young, I used water to dislocate a lot of insects. And they seem to have difficulty getting back to where they've been feeding. Yeah. And it reduced the Yeah, and you can yeah, and you can't just use a, a strong water spray. Of course you have to be careful how strong, because if it's really strong, you you get into the leaf and then you damage your leaf. But but yeah, just plain water will work as well because you're dislodging them and again, these guys are walkers. So they have to walk back. And that's a long way. So leaf cutter ants, is there anything you can do to prevent those that are tearing up the red buds? I mean, just like your picture, they are just <laughs> destroying my red buds. <laughs> I don't know. I, I looked on my big trees, and I couldn't find any damage at all. I could find them only on these little tiny seedlings that I had volunteering all through my gardens. So, um, well, it's, a, it's not a tiny seedling. It's, you know, several feet. Yeah, yeah, it's no, it's, it's it is a, the younger ones. Yeah, it's not the yeah, yeah, and they're the and totals. what they're doing the is they're 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 collecting the younger foliage too, the nice tender, juicy, not too much lignin in it yet foliage. I don't know. I mean, I didn't know what was doing it. Yeah, um, until I saw your slide, and I was like, "Yep, that's exactly that's what it." That's it. Those nice little. Yep. So, did you ever see the ants? No, I've never seen. Oh, you the have ants. it. Oh, they're a parade. No. It's really cute. You can see them. <laughs> this, this is the end of mine is talking. <laughs> um, um, I, I'm not sure how you would get rid of it. I mean, you could spray an insecticide, but then you're spraying, you're getting everything. Um, and um, and they're not interested in the ant baits because they're doing leaves. So ant baits usually are for breeze loving or sweet loving ants. Neither. Um, 
I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I guess you could sort of look to find out where the mound is and and possibly kill the mound, but then you're talking about another pesticide solution. Yeah, there is the spinosa, which is a, like for fire ants. I mean, essentially, you don't want to yes, kill Yes, but you ants. have to. But they have to collect it. Right. They have to collect it. They're not going to be collecting spinosa. They're right. not collecting about, stuff. If I, if I found it, what about boiling water? Uh, it, it actually, I listened to a fellow talk uh, on, they were doing um, uh, ant, stu ant colony studies in some place, and they actually were using boiling water because they didn't want to use any pesticides. And they effectively did it, but boiling water is a little hazardous. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you're carrying this bucket, oh, oh. you know, I mean, hazardous to you. Okay. And, um, in, and I'm it depends on the size of the <laughs> colony. I mean, if, if you've got a good-sized colony, you're gonna you're talking about 20 buckets of boiling water. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it. it. It may not be feasible. Well, I've never. I, did, I didn't even know it was the ants. I don't know yeah, what yeah. it is. I was just wondering. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny because I showed that uh, when I take, when I had taken the picture, I showed it to Bill, and I said, "Look at this," and he thought it was caterpillar damage. He said, "No, no, no, those are leaf cutting ants." And so well, how, how do you tell? And it's, it's this perfect little discs. And I haven't seen them on feeding on anything but red butt. Um, Epimedium. Oh, oh yeah? Now that I, I, I did not know till I saw that slide, but it was the perfect circle like they exactly. Okay, well I'll have to look at my what epimediums. 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 This year is the first year and I've had them there for several years. And this year I saw the little circles. I didn't know what. So I'll have to look to um, my epimediums and see if they're bugging them. Because I, you know, I knew I had to take this picture and I was out there looking. Because of course, when I saw them earlier, you know, I wasn't thinking about doing this talk. So, anything else? Are systemic still to use? There are almost no systemics still on the market. You have them. They're probably pretty old. I mean, there are some commercially available. Yeah, imidacloprid is widely used. But is that a, a, a available for homeowners? It is. Okay. It's been banned in Europe and a lot of places, yeah. but we still allow it here. Okay. And and the problem with systemics is, of course, that it, it gets everything. And if you if a plant takes it up it gets into the nectar, which means that everything feeding on the nectar is going to be getting a bit of clovers as well as the and, and insects that are feeding on the leaves. So that's, and of course, many of the, the reason all the, almost all the systemics are banned is because they discovered they got into the groundwater. They last, they were very, very good at their job. <laughs> but there was this downside. So if there's honeydew, is it either aphids or white flies? Yeah. Nothing else? Yeah. Because it takes somebody in that group that, that basically honeydew is um, a, a plant, insects in the um, hemipteran family all have these sort of straw-like mouth parts. And so what they're doing is they tap into the plant phloem. They actually go to they hit a vein. And then um, the pressure of the uh, sap inside the vein is so great that it pushes that fluid through the aphid. And the aphid has this really, really long digestive tract. So on the way out, it's collecting as much sugar as it can, but it doesn't get it all. So a lot of what comes out the rear end is much like what came in the front end, which is plant sap that has sugars in it. And it is the sugars that are allowing the fungi to grow. So it's, um, I don't know, did I answer the question? Yeah. Because <laughs> I have verbenas and pots, and it, they, there's just honeydew all over them. Yeah. And I did um, some kind of spray with oil in it. Yeah. I think it was neem oil. And it, you know, the plants just crisped up. Yeah, yeah. That's it, that, 
The oils are really, and a lot of the horticultural oils, they will say on them only when the, leaf, the plant is not in leaf. Right. Because uh, they're tough. There are some oils that they do say are safe for plants with leaves, but if you read the instructions, they say you may need to wash this off. <laughs> So five in the morning. Yeah, I did evening. it. I did so it in the evening so that it, the sun wouldn't. Yeah. Be, but they were too, probably too far gone. Yeah. And the fact is that once you've got that black sooty mold, you know, I mean, you're talking. It's t it can be really, really tough to sort of clean them up. But you know, a collection is a wonderful <laughs> control. You know, either kill or um, pluck off leaves. I mean, if you see, um, see something, as a matter of fact, I have a, a Brugmansia that's growing, and, and it's got holes all over it now. And so I went out yesterday and said, okay, something's eating this. And it turns out all the holes were being made when the leaves were young, because then you'd see this expanded hole, and it was clearly not newly fed on. And lo and behold, potato tuber worms. Potato tuber worms. Oh, well, it's a caterpillar. Um, Brugmansia is in the same family as potatoes and tomatoes, so. Anyway, but it, vigilance, you know, go out, you see some damage, start hunting and collect. Yeah. Does anyone, you mentioned moles, does anyone have any advice about getting rid of them? I mean, I've gone. We just had that whole talk by that guy who was, <coughs> yeah. Are you sure they're moles and not bowls? Not sure. I know with the recent rains, I've got a hole in my yard this big and about this deep. I haven't seen anything tunnel. come. It's a collapse where the rain just washed yeah. it all out. But it's about this big, and then I've got some smaller ones around it. And, of course, you said the grass dies off. Yeah. Well, the grass often dies off because of the because of the, of the uh, slugs eating it. Because uh -huh. they're chowing down on the roots. And, and the, not to say that the moles can't have an effect, because mm -hmm. basically they create these big air pockets and then the roots dry out. Mm -hmm. But um, much of the dying out So is, maybe they're gone and I'm just left with the empty tunnels underneath? Or? It could be. You know, one of the things, this sounds really dumb, but one of the things to do this, you know, you just crush those tunnels because they have to remake them. And the voles generally are not very good at making their own tunnels, but they will use mole tunnels. And of course, voles eat plants and moles eat yeah. bugs. I haven't seen any damage to any of my plants. It's well, just, in, it's in the grassy area. Yeah. Oh, and usually they say there's not that many moles. It seems it like may only be one that's yeah. got his territory <coughs> area. Territorial, and uh -huh. there's usually just a couple in an area. So uh -huh. if you can kind of step on it and yeah. run them out. It's like hard red pack clay. Yeah, they're good. But they've made tunnels. Aerating yeah. yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's coming up this fall. Sure. New grass. Well, my I just know that I know that mine are moles because it's all a mulched area beneath, beneath um, fruit trees. Yeah. And so that just tells me it's got to be moles eating worms. Well, the moles, the moles will come in because they will work on the roots of your fruit trees. Mm -hmm. And they like mulch because it's easy to dig through. They're not great diggers. Okay. Mm -hmm. So okay. So, maybe so check your up. fruit trees right around the bank. Okay. okay. But the moles are the ones that will raise the ground up. <coughs> yeah, yeah. The you'll see, you'll see little holes with the voles. And if you pull the mulch back, you'll see excavate. Like if you have a flagstones or something, if you lift up a flagstone, yes. you'll see the excavated little tunnels. That's voles. Well, it could be moles, too. Yeah, yeah. It could be moles. But if they're real tiny. Well, voles, are, yeah, voles are not really very good at tunnels. And oftentimes, if you find tunnels, it could be ants. Remember the picture of that, that um, uh, ant colony, so insects can make those tunnels too under your flagstones. Yeah. The wildflower convention. Was yeah, in Callaway. Where is it? Yeah, uh, it's at Western Carolina. It's uh, the not done by the Native Plant Society. It's called the Native Plant Conference. It's for four days. 
you get to stay in their dorms, which is not bad. They have good food, they have dancing at night, and they have wonderful talks and great field trips. And if you're interested in native plants, I mean, I, I go, I've been going every year since I, I discovered it. And, and I always feel like they, I get so much information. If I figure if I can retain 10% of it, I have done really well. But it's a blast. So, and it's mid-July, I think, 17th or what that starts. Yeah, they do. If you, if you Google, I would Google uh, Native Plant Conference Cullowee, and it'll come up. That's it. Okay. Thank you.